So we're going to do here. So it is basically 70s food issues, really, is what we're talking about here. A couple of specifically that we're going to focus in on. And the, the, the impetus of this discussion was really that I was, uh, as we were talking about different topics we could do, Bobby showed me a couple of different examples of a couple of things that I thought were kind of interesting. But then kind of the callback that I thought of as well was that when we were talking the other day, a couple of weeks back, about the whole kids and the hobby thing, and my thought process is kind of we were talking out loud. I thought it was kind of interesting that in, once I was thinking about it a little bit more, I was thinking that the food issues were a really good gateway for kids. You know, cards and cereal, uh, the cards on cra on the back of craft boxes, uh, the McDonald's cards, uh, you know, when I was growing up and stuff like that. And there was no shortage of food issues and different things. So even in the world, and I thought it'd be funny, in a world where like you can't get retail, what if there were? cards inside of cereal boxes where it's like what are you going to do hoard all the cereal boxes well i guess you could but you're gonna have to do something with that cereal at some point you're gonna look kind of stupid especially a card at a time especially if the cards themselves don't have the big pull that you're going to try to get something out of it still leaves it still leaves a product where well if the kid's gonna eat the cereal anyway or even if they try to convince their parents they're gonna eat the cereal anyway that was a tradition one way that a kid could build a set and it gave them something to chase and it was a simple, straightforward thing. That's why a lot of these food issues worked for so long. And uh, we, we really don't see a lot of those anymore. No, even uh, Gary Vee uh, made a reference to uh, the food issue. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the next big thing that's coming, you know, beyond the cards. Eh, interesting that he said that. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me just because it's like, it's something that was so prevalent. And the reason why we're focusing on the 70s is because there were a lot of them in the 70s. And like, even by the time I was growing up in the 90s, uh, in the late 80s, they were all over the place. There were plenty of them still. More so. Uh, yeah, still. So there was a lot of room. So I'll just include Paul's comment here. And this one's appropriate. The first Cody Carl's owning and keeping was a craft Yari Curry, the drawing one. There so, yeah. so like there's for collectors that have been around a while, a lot of those issues are going to hold some memories because there were a lot of them at the time. So there's two in particular we're going to focus on. And I think the first one was Coca-Cola related. Is that right? It is 1977, 78 Coca-Cola. Okay, sounds good. Now, do you want me to use the picture that I had, or do you want me to use, or do you? No, have I can. I can bring up the. Uh, you'll have to do the share screen. Sure. Uh, yeah. So when you're ready, so when you're ready, feel free, and I can put it up on the screen for us. Okay. Okay. So here we have uh, 1977, 78. Uh, uh, Coke issued um, cards, uh, five cards you'd get in the bottom of a Coke, um, a hollowed out bottom Coke cup. Uh, now this was available at different retail, uh, different establishments. I, you know, not so much Seven Eleven, but uh, maybe any other restaurant chain or or what have you. Um, so as you can see by the advertisement, uh, you could uh, there's 30 cards in this set, and uh, all you would do is um, here. I'll get to it. This is what the cards look like here, and here's what actually the original Coke cap, uh, uh, the Coke. Um, <clears throat> looks like there okay i wanted to oh there we go so in the bottom of the the uh the hollowed out space they would put this little insert in there and below the insert there was a little space and you can take that out and there would be five cards underneath so there's 30 cards in the set it looked like you would get five cards per and uh, you could also mail away for an album now this is a very creative thing uh because uh, soda pop those type of things, they had them on bottle caps back in the 60s. There wasn't really much promotional uh, ways for them to advertise or promote um, collectibles. And this was a great way of doing it. And it, it, it happened over the years. So as you can see here is a little bit more of a better scan. You could um, send away for your sports cards for a dollar and a, what was it, limited to a dollar for the album if you just mail in. And here's the album that you would get and you would open it up and it would have names of all the different stars within and what you would do is separate those cards such as the bobby or there would have the information on the back and a name slot for them and then you would just insert it into your album and you try to collect all of them so you'd kind of keep going back to try to get five more cards to match up so you could put them in your uh, your album now one quick thing i'll uh, interject here because uh, because as you show these pictures uh, one of the one of the features of a lot of the food issues especially in this time period even a little bit for a while thereafter was the old collector album like this they really had a lot of ways of being like well even if you're not getting a checklist it's like it's right there this these are the ones that are supposed to be available in the series these are the ones that you're chasing after and as you're filling spots in the album you 
you kind of know whereabouts you are. One other quick thought I had as well, as far as the Coca-Cola thing is concerned, I always thought it was funny when they would put stuff in the bottom because, because I think probably some of the scarcity of some of those issues are like, if you're not paying attention and you forget it's down there because you, because I think it was, you said it was like a pull tab and then you get it out of there. Yeah, on the bottom. It was advertised on the bottom of the cup, understood. Mm -hmm. But somebody's just drinking, having a burger and fries, um, you know, exactly. Carlos's favorite. And uh, they would just forget about it. Exactly. And I'm sure a lot were left over at the end. So here's an uncut sheet of actually all the different players in there. And you do have a wide variety. It's funny, there's only one Toronto and uh, a couple Pittsburgh, one Cleveland Barons, uh, a few uh, actually quite a few in new york but i think it doubles down as new york islanders and new york rangers nice so uh, at least they at least they included the short-lived cleveland barons franchise in they there. did yes so i got a quick question from victor here sure so were they stickers or stamps no they are um perforated cards uh could you call them stamps possibly but they're cardboard so i'd have to say they're cards so basically a little so we go back here pieces. yeah so they're about two inches square Mm -hmm. or a little bit less yeah i call them cards then i think that's still fair yeah it's fair they don't look great in the uh, psa holders but they still stand up pretty well so and that would be the back and they gave you some great information i think this is out of atlanta because i think that's where head office of coke was but uh it was mostly a u.s this is a, a typical usa issue not for canada so i actually applaud them very much uh so for um early hockey promotions in the usa they're trying as hard as they can to promote uh, hockey within in the united states and uh, they did a pretty good job with this one i have to give them credit and a lot of people don't know about these that's the back of the sheet uh so at least it had you know a little bit of bio information on each player and what have you so they're pretty detailed and so very well done uh issue and like i said they were limited to you know what do you what do you do when you have a soft drink uh, you know you can put it on the cap or you can do a mail away but they really like doing a uh, you know an in-hand kind of uh, collectible which you know keeps more interactive uh, keeps the uh, the kid more interactively going back to the same place so it, it, it benefits the um, any restaurant chain that has them because people come back because the kids want to have them you know i think uh, carlos like you said like the mcdonald's you come back and you get fries you know, and you get the uh, cards, the McDonald cards. And this is the same. You come back, you get a soda, and you could get uh, more cards underneath the uh, the bottom of the hollowed-out space. So very creative. However, very hard to find in today's market. Mm -hmm. And I think it made a lot of sense in kind of playing off of the conversation we had. One of the points that I made about it is that with Coca-Cola, that makes a lot of sense. And Justin uh, just included the comment here that, you know, kids would come, would come up and ask for, for your empty cup. And the kids that wanted to try to build their collection, that was a tactic, especially when you have a product like that that's associated where, hey, somebody else buys it. That's part of the reason why, even though I don't have an issue, um, in contrast to the McDonald's card I was talking about, I, I, I don't have an issue with the Tim Hortons cards they do today. I still think there is value to that. It's yeah. a lot harder, though, when it's like, yeah, it's with a coffee or it's with something you're buying at Tim Hortons, which you can still do. Obviously, people do. Tim Hortons is popular, but it was different when you're just buying some fries. You know, you're buying some fries and some stuff and then getting packs of cards. It's like, I could see a kid going to get some fries as opposed to a kid going to get a coffee. A medium double double is probably not going to be their first choice. No, no. I, sus I suspect they give you it with other products. Like, I'm pretty sure most of the Tim Hortons managers would probably be pretty lenient about that. But it's still an unnatural combination compared to say in order it's fries. more an adult product yes yeah yeah which is yeah. kind of an interesting approach but anyway. this this was you know for kids or anybody uh, you know i'd be uh, i'd be garbage can diving for empty cups back in the day mm -hmm. that's what i would be doing i'd be going in for the people who forgot about it or didn't realize that it was there and i'd be going through the garbage constantly just to you know complete your set so very interesting issue you know, Coke advertised a lot with the uh, within the NHL and obviously, you know, baseball, football, what have you. And they had very little to work with um, uh, promotional wise um, with these kind of, you know, uh, premiums uh, that are related to their product without having to mail in. Um, so this is a direct uh, it was great. It was a direct uh, um, effort uh, with the uh, consumer and the uh, distributor. Mm -hmm. 
Now, let me ask you a quick question here since I sure. was looking at the comments. I can obviously I'll check out the checklist as well, and we can definitely look at that. As far as the players in it, um, were there any kind of early year players or they're predominantly veteran players? Uh, it looks like they're veteran players. It, I, I would say Bobby Orr is in his last year with, yes. with uh, Chicago. Actually, it says right. Chicago, so yep. um, mostly veteran players. If you look, there's quite a few Montreal. You have Cornway, you have uh, uh, Guy Lapointe. Um, uh, Steve Shutt, uh, and then I think Larry Robinson. So most of them are veteran players at this time because yeah. the rookie cards are usually the earlier part of the 70s. You have Daryl Sittler, 70, 71, uh, you know, uh, Rod Gilbert earlier for sure. Um, yeah. uh, the only reason I ask is because uh, Justin brought it up because era wise, it would have been appropriate, it would have been interesting what would have happened maybe with the popular of the set if they had been able to find a way to squeeze Bossy in there. Because yeah, time. I'm actually quite surprised that they didn't, but I guess it was yeah. a little too early for Bossy. Yeah, but yeah. It, t- timing, but it would have been made for a very interesting collectible, especially for the Islander fans and Bossy collectors and things like that, because that would have been a very early Bossy issue, early in his career, and right around his rookie year would have been interesting. Very interesting, for sure. Rogi Vashon, I think he's the only goalie in this set, to be honest with you. Yeah. I think he's the only one who got the nod for the Nets. Yeah, It's always interesting as well. It's one of those different things. Where oh, Billy was, Smith. Sorry, up at the top there. Yeah, it's always interesting because somebody at some point had to make a decision on the checklist. Obviously, yeah. you wanted to include Bobby Orr for obvious reasons, but obviously he was at the tail end of his career, like you said. That was literally at the end. And his time in Chicago is not remembered the same as his time in Boston. It's not quite the same thing. <laughs> but he still but he still deserved to be in there as, as a big-time player still at the tail end. Do you see how his is so predominant compared to the others? Mm-hmm. Like it has a little bit of red background and kind of pops more than the other ones have that white or different colored background. Very different. Yeah. Oh, we also have Doug Favell there too. Sorry. So we do have a few net minders throughout. There you go. Sounds good. Anything else you want to add on the Coca-Cola piece? Uh, no, it kind of segues right into the next one. Okay. So this next one's interesting, guys. So I wanted to, we wanted to start off with this one because it's kind of a straightforward one to figure out. We know Coca-Cola. That's, you know, and you can imagine set like that. But Bobby also mentioned another food issue set that was very interesting that borrows some elements of it and uh, definitely is one that you're not going to see every day. So take it away, Bobby. Okay. In 1978, um, a 7-Eleven, obviously, as you can see by the uh, Telus Pizzito card, issued a, and I believe this to be a test issue. Um, this was under the cups. These cards are approximately about two inches square by one and five eighths, one seven eighths, uh, somewhere between there. Now these were issued under the cups. We're only assuming this is such a rare issue that, um, most people have never probably seen them, uh, out there and they're very, uh, what they are is they are a lenticular card. So they would have, if you would tilt it on an angle, you would see that, Well, let me preempt that exograph came out with a new type of uh, lenticular. Lenticular was usually a two-scene um, action card, where if you change the angle, you would see uh, one scene and then the, the final scene, where this lenticular would show you a minimum of about seven scenes that you could see. So it would be very, um, very flowing. So you would see the whole action of somebody backhanding as, as Phil Esposito is. So this is a very, uh, very, very rare set. Um, and I do think it was a test issue. Uh, I'm not too sure. It's out of the United States exclusively, and uh, we've only found so many cards. I think there's seven cards in the set, and I'll leave uh, Carlos to tell for the last one. Uh, the next card in the set, we have O.J. Simpson, and on the back it explains, you know, the first man in the NFL history to rush over 2,000 yards, and everybody knows that. Um so they are kind of interesting on the back. Um, they're called Magic Motion. They're called Action Cards. They're Sports Spotlight, and it's by Exograph and through 7-Eleven. So we don't know what moniker it's really taking, but I think uh, Magic Motion 7-Eleven Exograph is probably, you know, suitable at that point. So uh, a very, very rare card. I think there's only um, – there's a few known of the Esposito and maybe two known of the OJ. Uh, the next one we have is – uh, I don't have the back for this because they're so rare and hard to find. Uh, the Steve O'Neill, uh, he, I think he punted a, I can't remember the amount. Uh, maybe somebody in the uh, comment section would know. I was at a uh, 80 yard punt or 98 yard punt. One of the longest punts in history in 1970. 
Unfortunately, I don't have the bag to show you. And here we go. We have uh, Hank Aaron. And uh, I think it says World Television uh, audience looking on. He broke Babe Ruth's career home run record, 715. And, uh, you know, they're taking the best stars and trying to put them in there. Phyllis Vizito for 1978, maybe not the best star, but definitely had the points to show for it. Um, Hank Aaron, of course, O.J. Simpson, Steve O'Neill's kind of a, hmm, I guess they had to say. So you have one hockey, two football, and two baseball. You do have Nolan Ryan as well. He's, uh, he's probably one of the most desired. There's a lot of Nolan Ryan collectors out there. So uh, getting back to the Hank Aaron, there's only one known of the Hank Aaron. And I think there's about three known of the Nolan Ryans. Yeah. And I think that time-wise, especially 1978, by that point, you know, the back talks about it, but he had established himself firmly as a premier power pitcher at that time, breaking the strikeout record and get it, getting no hitters. And it was a, it was a big deal, especially. So in 1978, oh, yeah. Nolan Ryan was just developing into the peak of his powers. And then he'd go hide, hang out in the National League for the decade of the 80s, which made it very interesting. But he had a long career. This was only the beginning of Nolan Ryan's prominence. But by this point, he had established himself as a star. And sure. And we're guessing at the year on these, but we do believe it's 1978. Somewhere yeah. around there. It's and really the hard. Right up matches up with it because they talk about a 77 season. So timing wise, it seems about right. Yes. Yes, of course. So we have two baseball. We have two football. We have one hockey. And then we step in and pugilism at its best. We have Rocky Marciano, um, you know, world uh, two time worldwide uh, world heavyweight champion. Uh, just a, another great card. Uh, I They re really went back from Marciano, comparatively speaking, to Nolan Ryan. And Hank Aaron, well, no, he did play through the 70s. So um, going back to Marciano, it was kind of interesting that they wouldn't have picked a Sugar Ray Leonard or, or somebody else, Muhammad Ali, around that time period. I don't know if there was any licensing. I really don't think so, because the lenticular doesn't really look like the player. However, maybe they needed something... Uh, you know, to, to, to do the write-up on the back. I'm not too sure. But it is 7-Eleven, and they were quite well known for, you know, uh, issuing a lot of different items. So, um, and then we hit Wilt Chamberlain, Wilt the Stilt. And uh, this is the only known uh, issue of uh, Wilt Chamberlain. So they really covered the bases, uh, so to speak, with uh, having a, a lot of variety of stars. And uh, like I said, one, only one known of, uh, of that one, uh, as well as the Rocky Marciano, there's only one known as well. So these were in the bottom of the cups of 7-Eleven. Uh, I did include, so in 1978 as well, 7-Eleven um, issued a thing called Roto Cup. And it would be a lenticular design where you would insert this into this Roto Cup and you would end up with a, an action scene or a lenticular action scene. So we think it's somewhat related. Uh, there's a hollow space in the bottom of the cup and we think it was related there. But I truly believe that this was a test issue and one of the, the rarest ones, you know, all, although primitive looking, there are still cards. They were still issued through a major company. So I believe they're, uh, they're certainly uh, the most interesting cards I've seen. And here is, um, I've taken five different scenes of, uh, of the, of the uh, Hank Aaron. And he's swinging. You can see the follow through. I missed a couple. It's very hard to take pictures and drop them in. But you can see the ball coming across and he's hitting it. And uh, that's how the lenticular exograph really worked it was more of a, a rather than a one two it was a five six or seven different motion a very good technology for the time period mm -hmm. and uh that's about it for that yep so i'll quickly add one or two things there is that one of the things that struck me when bobby showed it to me uh was that uh is there anything else you want to share on the screen there no that's fine sure so I'll yeah. drop it off for now. But one of the things that struck me as kind of interesting was uh, as we were chatting about it, and he was showing me a couple of the different uh, images and things like that, is that for, obviously for 1978, that was that was impressive technology because uh, to kind of to Bobby's point is that the lenticular was usually those two. It was closer to like a sports flicks, uh, you know, basically the same kind of idea that they came out with because sports flicks didn't have a lot of movement on it. But then when you look at one where you've got more additional spots, then that 
you know, coming back full circle to that McDonald's is that you had that one year in McDonald's where you had kind of their motion because the one that struck me and I've, I've talked to Vinny about it before in the past is there was a Lemieux where you could tilt it and you were getting a lot of the motion of the shot heading into the, heading into the net. So it was a couple of different scenes. So they had a couple of those were along those lines, but that was, that was by the mid nineties, mid to late nineties. So it was years and years and years later. And I remember even at that point, that was kind of a cool looking thing where it stood out a little bit more than the standard lenticular fare that, that I'd be used to from just a couple of motions because Fleer used that and a couple of different ones use similar, that kind of thing later on. It's interesting. Um, uh, the couple of people that I've talked to uh, said they, uh, they acquired them in New Hampshire. And I do remember that uh, the test issue or for the United States 1966 test issue, uh, the wrapper was found in New Hampshire. There's another test issue. I'm just, just putting it out there. I really don't know if it has any correlation. I'm just saying maybe New Hampshire was a great place to uh, test market things. This was certainly a test issue because we would have seen more. And uh, do you want to follow up with the last one? Yes. So right now, to testament to how rare the issue is, because all the information that Bobby's compiled, the images and all that have been over years and years and years of research, asking around, talking with, you know, putting out posts on net 54 and asking those collectors have a lot of knowledge and they've seen a lot of things and trying to pool the collective knowledge of a lot of different collectors in a lot of different areas. And even then where we were looking around just to get a, to gauge a couple of different things. I don't remember the exact context when we were just looking, but I, I went digging into PWCC's, uh, you know, auction history. And the problem with this type of research is you can find information, but without pictures and things, you don't know exactly what it was. But in the course of searching, we were able to find what was a listing for an exograph of Don Carter, who's a bowler. A very famous bowler, actually. If you look, he was promoted on so many things. Yeah. And the thing is, outside of that one reference on the one line That's of a it. supposed sale that happened back in 2008, there's no record of that ever having existed. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Maybe the person randomly decided to put Don Carter in with it, but... Exograph, Magic Motion, Sports Spotlight, it all had, it had every everything listed on that listing. So I would venture to say probably 100% that that's another one. We don't know. I thought there'd be maybe tennis over bowling, uh, maybe a, a Marina Nevsro. No, not even that early. Yeah, Chris Everett Lloyd, maybe, or somebody else in a, in a tennis. Uh, maybe Arthur Ashe or even Macro. Oh, Macro was 80, so uh, 78 is kind of that time period. But to, think, uh, but to think also that with that much time and that much research to have a checklist be so small. And then, uh, and then I, sent, I sent Bobby the screen, as we were looking at it together, but I also sent him the screenshot of it so that he can take it with him and then maybe down the road some more information will surface somewhere. I, I searched everything. I'll tell you, I went high road, low road. I went everywhere and I could not find nothing. It is yeah. so, you know, you think the internet is a great place for mm -hmm. research and it is, but it's only, you know, a lot of times I end up finding my own stuff when I'm looking for information. And that's the sad part is I'm going, am I the only one posting about this stuff? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of sad, but you know, that's what, that's what the thing of rarity of um, a food issue. And uh, guess who has the wealth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was the other thing, yeah. Uh, Bobby has the Will Chamberlain on that one, so they they are obscure and they are rare. Now I will say to you, I'll send you the screen. I'll send you the screenshot later. But I try. I actually tried doing the search again, using oh, okay. slightly different search parameters. Yeah. And I came up with Jesse Owens and Roger Staubach. No way. Oh yes. Wow. So I'll send that to you after. It's I'll getting bigger, after. and we, we have no pictures of them. We have no, but no that, that. going. So one was an auction in two thousand and eight, and one was an auction back in two thousand and four. And wow. those two and those two 2008 auctions happened on the same day. So I would guess I'd be shocked if it wasn't the same seller. Same seller. Yeah, probably. Sure. But that's but that's little how thin the threads are. It's like it's a line of a of historical record that was kept in an archive. But unfortunately, we don't have a picture. So we have no idea what the heck they were actually trying to sell at the time. Well, thanks for leaving that for a surprise. Now you got me really going. I, as it, soon as know, I saw it, I thought I thought I would throw that one. Out. That's the bane of my existence of being of a, a historian is is to find out new information. You know, I could own something and be very happy with it. But finding out information, I'm even more excited. I just that that satisfaction of the treasure hunt is you know come to a conclusion now it's never over with this issue because with being so few out there and 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 talking to the top 
collectors and 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 like you said you know the collector's universe uh, those guys really know their stuff i didn't find anything I, one guy said he had a nolan ryan that was it you know one and you'd think for a 7-eleven issue it would be a little bit more predominant maybe it wasn't good advertising maybe it was in the roto cups and people didn't care or didn't see it who knows what happened but regardless they're out there they're documented so and I, that just means i'm just when, when i found the esposito i had the esposito many many years ago and i didn't think really anything of it and then i found the hank aaron mm -hmm. and then i found a few others and i started doing some research and i went wow this is amazing this is about 10 years ago and once you start finding that information then that realizing that nobody else knows that information it becomes stimulating because hey maybe i found something very interesting and so i wrote a nice article on it uh just to cover my basis so i so i didn't really leave myself going back and having to re-research it again i now i can go forward i have the article i can always reread it in another year or two from now and, and look back and go okay this is what all right i got it all down and I don't have to uh, think about it again. So we're looking for a couple new ones. Well, quite a few new ones. Pitchers are everything. Like I said, I don't have the back of the Steve O'Neill for the football. And the football collectors, I'll tell you, they'd be, they'd be chasing that down pretty good. It's not a real picture of the player, but it is noted on the back that it is that player. Yeah. And be it lenticular or not, it's still a highly desirable uh, uh, oddball issue. I, I don't like using oddball, I, a food issue, sorry. Yeah. No, I think I think what makes it interesting is just that because it is so rare and th this is a conversation we we're having as well. We're in this weird market where now people want to be able to say they have the one, even if it's weird. Yeah. They like I, I suspect there's probably a group of like, oh, this, uh, you know, this card is so common. You know, at this point, even a PSA 10 rookie of some of these players is like, well, that's so common, but something obscure and weird, like for, like I said, like that Will Chamberlain doesn't look anything like Will Chamberlain, but it doesn't matter. It, it's written as Wilt, and it's potentially a test issue, and it's something obscure. Jesse Owens see. makes so much sense, though. He would fit you into know? the type of player they would put in there. Yeah. yeah, you know, if any runner you can think of, well, he started, what he was in the 36, the opening Olympics, uh, right. 1936, uh, you know, uh, such a prolific runner. Uh, and who was the other one? Sorry, again. Uh, it was uh, Roger Staubach another oh my another football and he mm. would have been and he would have been late 70s he would have been probably perfect the timing Super Bowl for the cowboys yeah yeah that's why it's hard to date because you have jesse owens you have marky marciano and then you have nolan ryan it's like where do we fit in to these ones nolan ryan and roger staubach would at least been active or close to active players at the time yeah uh, because almost all the even hank aaron retired in, after 76 so all yeah. the other players would have been retired except for potentially maybe a handful yeah, so if it was a Canadian issue, we would have different players. You know, it wouldn't have been Phil Esposito. It probably would have been, you know, Bobby Orr or somebody else more on a Canadian team like Richard or Bellavo or Tim Orr. I don't know who. And for the 70s, you can't really say too much about the Leafs on the 70s. However, we will just say maybe this will say Tim Orr. Wouldn't that have been cool? Yeah, if the fact that you can go to retired players means it opens up the possibilities. That, but that's why I think it's interesting potentially. And again, the problem with that type of research is that, okay, so they said exo, they've got the right terms. Exograph is there. They've got the yeah. right verbiage. Seven Eleven, like they've got the right keywords. You're looking perfect. For. Yeah. But then the question becomes like, okay, but what did you actually have? And it was twelve years ago, thirteen years ago, and it's hard to say. Yeah, well, see, the exograph continued on into the um, into the Kellogg's cards for baseball, mm -hmm. but it didn't have the magic motion and it didn't have the sports spotlight. So any of those key other words that are within that, it would exclusive, exclusively be probably one of those. Okay, so think. you do have yeah. magic motion. So I, I, I've emailed yeah. you the picture. So you no... at, at least it's a start. Perfect. Wonderful. There you go. So my so we're sending Bobby on his uh, on his new wild goose chase. Okay. See y'all. I gotta go research. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So thanks, Bobby. I appreciate that. That was wonderful. Thank you.